So we're about to talk about generalized linear models, but before we do that, we need to talk about general linear models. Uh, I did not name them. The names are horrible. Uh, sorry. Uh, general linear models are simpler than generalized, and a general model is uh, linear regression where we have modified the uh, data to linearize it. We'll talk more about that in a second. I'm just going to go back through a formal definition of a linear model. I want everybody to know this. Um, here we've got beta sub zero for the intercept, beta sub i for one of our estimated parameters for one of our independent variables. In other words, when we have multiple linear regression, we're going to have multiple independent variables. That's our x of i. We're going to have multiple betas because there'll be one beta for each x of i. And then we'll have um, errors or residuals um, for each of our data points as the difference between the predicted value and um, what we saw in the field, our data values, as y sub i being the dependent value or um, our field data. Okay, so um, notice this is only two dimensions. It's hard to visualize uh, even a multiple linear regression model with two independent variables, let alone three or four. So we're just looking at a view of one um, theoretical one here. Formally, the equation for that looks like this. Y sub i equals beta sub zero plus beta one times x one sub i. So notice that's one. So that's the first data point. Um, sorry, that's the i is now all the data for our first independent variable, the one that's matched to beta. So beta one, x of one, that's our first independent variable, which can have multiple x's in it, right? So this would be like multiple precipitation values. And over here, we have a beta 2 x2, which might be multiple temperature values being for the same y, the same dependent um, value based on multiple independent variables, OK? So uh, ask me questions about that definitely in our discussion if you're still struggling with that, because we're going to move on in a second. Um, all right, so um, you saw this with uh, the golf uh, ball exercise where we bounce golf balls and um, I said, oh yeah, they should be linear, right? And they weren't linear. So in order to model that, um, you can linearize the data. In other words, if our function is something like a simple exponential, okay, notice it's not a linear um, relationship, it's an exponential relationship. So now we have e, uh, which is a common value that's used as an exponent. There's a lot of natural phenomenon that follows that exponential relationship. Um, but this could also be a different number. This could be 10 to the x, could be something else, based on the phenomena that you're modeling. And then our error is moved up here. So it's x plus our error is raised, or e is raised to x plus our error. And that's actually important. OK, so one example of that might be this equation, which is what I used in Excel to create this graph. OK, you're seeing this graph here, the smooth part. And then I injected some error into it in Excel. And then I ran an exponential regression against it, which linearizes it, as you see here, where we've linearized the data. Now, the way you can do that is, in this case, because natural log is the inverse of raising something to the power of e, OK? we can take the natural log of both sides of this equation. Now, when we take the natural log on this side, we get the natural log of y. On the other side, when you take the natural log of two things that are multiplied together, the result is the natural log of the first one plus the natural log of the second one. So here we have the natural log of 1.205. And then over here, we have the part from the exponent, because when you take the natural log of something that's raised to the power of e, the natural log and the e cancel each other out, and so we just end up with what is in the exponent. Now, if you take a look at this, this is a static value, right? We can just compute that, put that in a calculator, compute what it is. Um, then we'll have an intercept, and we'll have our a, or uh, beta 1, times x. So this becomes our beta 0, this becomes our beta 1, and suddenly we have a linear equation. So we've linearized our model. Now, the reason that the exponent, or sorry, the, uh, the error, 
the residual being in the exponent is important because one of the things that's happening here is that you can only do this if the residuals get bigger as your um, y values get larger. Okay. Otherwise, you can't do it because when we linearize it, you'd have bigger errors here and smaller ones here, which kind of looks like that, but it's just because of the random values that we had. Um, these would be much larger and these would be much smaller um, if the errors weren't distributed um, on the exponential side, if they weren't being um, part of the exponent. And you can only really find that out by looking at the graphs or running a test on it. Okay, so that's a general linear model. And there's different ways of linearizing data. And you do want to look at this, especially if you're looking at population growth, because that is exponential. With our golf ball bouncing, it was a natural log that it was following. So we could actually do the reverse process, take the exponential of our data, and suddenly it would be linear. And then we could apply linear regression, which is great because linear regression is really simple. It's really fast, well understood, lots of tools for it. So if we can do linear regression, we want to do it. And a general linear model um, will work for that. However, it only works um, if we have these fairly simple functions like natural log or, or uh, an exponent. Okay, um, so here just another way of looking at it. We've linearized our data using a log function. Okay, taking that function, converted it down to a linear model. Okay, all right. Um, so um, this is where we're transforming the predictor values, and now we have a linear relationship. Um, one of the things about this residuals do need to be from a normal distribution after you've transformed them. Before you transform them, they won't necessarily be. Going to be weird things happening. Once you transform them, then they need to be normal. So you test it after um, you've transformed them. And then it uses least squares to fit the model because it's linear regression. I need to say something about polynomial regression because it is built into R. It's fairly easy to do. And this is something we used to do a lot of along with systems of differential equations, more traditional mathematics. We did that because we didn't have the computer power and the algorithms we do now, so we did them by hand. Um, if you ever want to have fun for several weeks, go ahead and do some models off of polynomials. Um, it's pretty painful to do and lots of paper. Uh, but we don't really have to do them anymore, and they're difficult to control. They don't really represent natural phenomenon very well uh, once we get past those simple basic ones like exponent and, and uh, uh, natural log. Um, they're just not, not going to do what we need. We need something more um, because not all fall, phenomenon follow linear response. In fact, most natural ones don't except over very narrow ranges. And not all residuals are normally distributed. This leads us to needing other types of models like GLMs, which we'll talk about in a second, and GAMs, which are the most flexible. Um, these are non-parametric approaches. So um, when we say that, okay, um, what's happening is we're not making any assumptions about the parameters of the distribution um, of the residuals. Now, there's a lot of different um, definitions for parametric versus non-parametric. I don't use the term very much because of that, and it's another one of those terms that leads to some confusion. I just say that linear regression is simple and fast and easy, but it doesn't work on most of our data sets. GLMs work on more, GAMs work on even more. Um, and we get more modeling power with that. In fact, um, by the end of class, we'll be talking about additional methods beyond um, GAMs uh, that are used to deal with even more complex natural resource data sets. All right, so GLM, different from general linear model. Now we've got a generalized linear model. Okay, now this allows a linear function to be related to a response where it'll be a link function. We'll talk more about that. Residuals do not have to be normally distributed. Um, requires y to be from a defined probability distribution, more on that, and the fit is based on maximum likelihood rather than least squares. Okay, so um, a lot of this will be familiar to you. Oh, look, it looks like our equation for multiple linear regression, which will pop up over and over again, because internally what our software is doing is it is, again, linearizing our data. It's just doing it with more complex uh, mathematics then we can uh, certainly look at in this class okay but we still have our our basic um, equation with our beta ones beta twos 
and then we've added an error term. We've taken away the intercept because a lot of these methods, they kind of just ignore the intercept and don't worry about it. They take it out and zero reference everything internally to make the mathematics easier. But um, they do explicitly call out our error term or our residuals as epsilon. Okay, um, now we also need to define the expected value of this equation, okay? That's the expected value is the predicted value. So it would be the value if the error went away. Another way of saying it's our, our prediction. Okay, now notice what I've done here is I've said, well, what if we took our linear model and we said that here's our expected of so y, but we needed some function to convert that to a linear model. Exactly what we did with general linear models. Except what we're going to do is we're going to take g, which is defined as our link function, and we're going to um, put the inverse of g on both sides of our equation. That allows us to get our expected uh, function for y, or um, our prediction, um, using this inverse link function. And then we have our linear model buried in over here. Okay, um, and then again, the random components drawn from known uh, probability distribution. All right, so uh, these are the ones you will see in R. Um, there's a probability um, distribution, and then there's the link function that goes with it. Um, so uh, when we look at um, the first one, which is binomial, that's the one we see almost all the time. That's the one we'll be using heavily. Uh, because that's really where um, GLMs come in. It's when we have something that has true false values, alive or dead, or most commonly presence or absence. You've done a look for species and you found certain ones to be present, other ones to be absent, or it could be chemical, it could be um, disease, it could be any number of things where you've tested and found something in one spot and not in another. And binomial works well with that, and the link function is a logit, which is related to logistic. Okay, and then you also have Gaussian, which is an identity for the link, which means it's just a linear regression. So we don't want to worry about that one. Uh, use a linear regression for that one. Uh, I do see gamma and Poisson used once in a while. Gamma used for seed distribution, distance from things, height of trees would also work. But honestly, we just use another method for that. <laughs> uh, and then Poisson is when you would use it with counts, which that's probably the one I see once in a while um, besides binomial. Uh, you're familiar with the normal distribution, binomial, uh, the distribution for the residuals. The only thing that's really unique about that is that it has discrete values to it. Um, and we'll talk about the impact of that when you see the results in lab. Poisson is this distribution where it's, um, well, I should talk about gamma first. Gamma is the general mathematics behind a Gaussian distribution. So it allows you to not only have a normal distribution, which we're kind of getting to here, but it also allows you to have these skewed distributions. And these are important when you have things that don't have uh, negative values. So they're not normal because you can't go past uh, zero if you have something like height of a tree or a distance to a river. So that's where gamma tends to come in. I've seen it used with seed fall, things like that. So your residuals uh, should not go over this way, <laughs> okay, um, or the values of your equation. 